Good evening, everyone. My name is John Stewart, and I am an Associate Dean for Cultural and Community Engagement in FIU's College of Communication, Architecture, and the Arts. And it's Monday night, and I want to welcome you to Zen and the Art of Remembrance and Reckoning, which is the second in our four-part series planned for October in partnership with the Jewish American and Holocaust Literature Association and an affiliate of the ALA. Tonight, we'll be talking about the movie 1945. As always, I invite you to reach out throughout this event through the chat function and ask questions. If you send an email address, then we'll respond to the, and we don't get to your question, then we'll respond to the event and um, at, we'll respond to your question after the event. Now, I'd like to turn the attention to my, my co-partner uh, in crime here, Deborah Briggs. Uh, Deborah and I in the real world uh, work just a few blocks from each other. Uh, Deborah's at the Betsy Hotel and I'm at FIU's Miami Beach Urban Studios. And uh, I'd like to, and Deborah will really thank all of our collaborators and get started with what I'm sure is gonna be another great Monday night gathering. So um, we're gonna look forward to having, sharing a little Zen together and especially during this time of COVID, we all can use it. Deborah, nice to see you. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be here again and to have worked with your team to realize this new series. Um, I wanted to take a second before we get right to the meat of the matter tonight to thank um, not just uh, Miami Beach Urban Studios, which has been such an am amazing partner, but also the city of Miami Beach and, my and the Miami Jewish Film Festival. The film festival has been incredible in helping us negotiate uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, share the film with all the attendees. Um, and here are some of our other partners, the Florida Jewish Museum at FIU, Miami Beach Jewish Community Center, and the Holocaust Teacher Education Institute at University of Miami, and also the Holocaust Education Program in the Miami-Dade Public Schools. Those two programs are run by a Holocaust survivor whose name is Dr. Miriam Kazanoff. I wanted to give a shout out to her tonight because she has tirelessly committed her life to teaching about the Holocaust. And uh, I think this conversation tonight underscores why that is so important. Um, and she does it, of course, in, in the elementary schools, middle schools, high school, and in college. And so now it's my pleasure once again to introduce Dr. Holly Levitsky, who's been leading Jalit, the Jewish American and Holocaust Literature Association for 10 years. And during that time, I've had the immense pleasure of working with her at the Betsy to build their annual symposium. And with partners like uh, John Stewart at MBUS, we've been able over the years to design increasingly um, important, I think, community-based programs and public-facing events. This series is sort of an example of that and uh, of a way to bring the scholarship of some amazing academic um, writers and uh, scholars to the broader public. Every year, about 50 scholars come to the Betsy and share their um, research with each other. And so it's great to be able to share it with you tonight. Uh, a little more about Holly. She's the founder and director of the Jewish Studies Program and professor of English at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. And she's been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. She's also been a Fulbright scholar and she's been a scholar with the FIU Exile Studies Scholar in Residence Program which is housed actually at the Betsy and in partnership with the Department of English at FIU. Holly works primarily in the areas of Jewish American literature, Holocaust studies and exile studies. Yet she just completed a project that is so interesting. I wanted to bring your attention to it. It's a fascinating project that connected Jewish studies scholars and LDS scholars in a collection of essays about interreligious issues. So I urge you to Google that if that's of interest to you. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Holly who will introduce our scholars for the evening and we'll get going and watch some movie clips and talk about some important issues. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm delighted to be here um, to continue our jaw lit on the road virtual 2020 symposium, as we're calling it. We're in for another incredible evening tonight, a gathering of brilliant scholars sharing thoughts about 
the import and meaning, hopefully, of this amazing film, 1945. So what I'm gonna do is first read short bios of our presenters, um, then give you a short overview of the movie, uh, and then I'll introduce you to Lawrence Farron, who will be our first speaker. Um, before I do any of that, I just want to uh, thank and introduce my co-curator, Dr. Phyllis Lassner. Phyllis is the Professor Emerita at Northwestern University. Her many publications and international presentations include focus on World War II and Holocaust literature and film. Her most recent book is Espionage and Exile, Fascism and Anti-Fascism in British Spy Fiction and Film. And her current publications include essays on Polish post-Holocaust film, British Jewish art, and Holocaust escape memoirs. Our first speaker, Dr. Lawrence Barron, held the Nassiter Chair of Modern Jewish History at San Diego State University from 1988 until 2012 and directed its Jewish Studies program until 2006. He's authored and edited four books, including The Modern Jewish Experience in World Cinema, Projecting the Holocaust into the Present, The Changing Focus of Contemporary Holocaust Cinema. Uh, sorry, that was a one title. In 2006, he delivered the keynote address for Yad Vashem's first conference devoted to Hollywood and the Holocaust. His contribution to Holocaust studies was profiled in 50 key thinkers on the Holocaust and genocide. Our second speaker, Dr. Stuart Liebman, is Professor Emeritus of Film Studies at Queens College and in the PhD programs in Art History and Theater at CUNY Graduate Center. He's also taught at Columbia University and New York University, publishing widely on early French, post-war German and Russian cinema, yet his longtime project has been to recover and analyze films about the Holocaust during the first decade or so after the end of World War II. He's published widely on various aspects on that topic in English and French. He was a research fellow at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in 2004 and was named an Academy Film Scholar by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in 2006. His anthology, Claude Lonsman's Shoah, Key Essays, was published by Oxford University Press in 2007. Okay, so now I'm going to, uh, as briefly as possible, um, summarize the film we're going to be discussing to provide a context for tonight. And then I'm gonna turn it right over to uh, Lori Barron. Two Jewish men, one older and one younger, arrive at a train station in a Hungarian village. Their clothes and appearance instantly marks them as outsiders. Panic spreads among the populace that they are there to claim property expropriated by the locals when the Jews were deported. The Jews slowly proceed through the town following a wagon carrying two wooden cases marked as perfume and other toiletries. This raises fears among the town clerk whose son is slated to inherit the formerly Jewish owned pharmacy where such items would have sold. Others worry that they will have to return their houses and belongings to the Jews. While the few of the villages were not complicit, most of their compatriots were, including the constable, the priest, and the town drunk. The Jewish men eventually reach the Jewish cemetery where they conduct a funeral burying children's shoes, toys, and Jewish ritual objects since these items are what is left of the Jews who once resided there. The villagers congregate outside the cemetery, wielding potential weapons should the Jews demand restitution. Meanwhile, the jilted bride of the clerk's son sets fire to the drugstore. The Jews depart in the train belching dark smoke that hovers above the countryside. Now I turn it over to my friend and colleague, Lloyd Barron. Thank you, Holly. Most Hungarian Holocaust films are set in Budapest. 1945, on the other hand, is set in a small village in the countryside. This is significant because of the rapidity and totality of the Holocaust in the Hungarian provinces. 
The Horthy regime was anti-Semitic before it allied itself with Germany. Indeed, it had introduced, its, it came into power in 1920, and it introduced the first anti-Semitic laws in the interwar period in Europe. But its anti-Semitism was more about economic, political, and social discrimination, and not extermination. The Hungarian army did deport 20,000 foreign Jews who fell into their hands in Subcarpathia to Ukraine, and the army participated in their massacre there along with the Einsatzgruppen. It also conscripted able-bodied Hungarian Jewish men into labor battalions for lethal work assignments that killed 28,000 of them. Yet Hungary resisted German demands to deport Jews within its pre-war time borders, unlike other collaborationist regimes. In 1944, it contained the largest Jewish population remaining in Europe, 820,000. Of these, almost 300,000 were foreigners. As the German war effort faltered and the Red Army advanced, Horthy considered making a separate peace with the Allies. This was the pretext for Germany sending troops to occupy Hungary in late March of 1944, legalizing the Hungarian equivalent of the Nazi party, the Arrow Cross, and installing Hungarian racists in key governmental positions. In the provinces where 240,000 Jews lived, relocation and ghettoization occurred in April and ended in mass deportations to Auschwitz that began in May and lasted until early July and eventually totaled 473,000 Jews. The rural Jewish communities, which were predominantly Orthodox, were decimated and their Hungarian neighbors enriched themselves by purchasing Jewish property and belongings for a pittance at, or, at auctions. This was 13 months before the story of 1945 happens. So the vulnerability to returning Jewish property, particularly as the Soviets called for redistrib redistributing property were fresh. Though not as widespread or deadly as pogroms in Poland, two post-war pogroms occurred in Hungary in 1946, which also served as precedents for the plot line of 1945. The movie resembles Hollywood Westerns like High Noon with the storyline of strangers coming to town and causing a panic about nefari the nefarious intent of their visit. As you will hear, and you will hear much more about that from Professor Liedman. The movie is suffused with iconic images and items from the Holocaust. The director did this because he wanted to show these objects from the Shoah in a realistic way. From its outset, the train and the smoke at Belches remind us of deportations in the crematoria. Two wooden crates are unloaded, and they are big enough to resemble the pine caskets Jews are buried in. A railway war worker closes the latch of an empty freight car. Moments ago, that car was full of cargo, and only two crates were removed from it. Now it is empty, suggesting that the human cargo had been exited into the confines of a death camp. The background music is dissonant and foreboding. The high contrast black and white palette provides a documentary look, but lends a dark tenor to the film. The station master jumps on his bike to warn the town clerk that Jews have arrived. And I'm actually going to pick up on that, so I want to talk a little bit about the background noise. From the beginning, we hear, hear not only hear the engine coming in, it's making hissing sounds that almost sound like the breathing of a beast. You can constantly hear horses segue through the scenes. Uh, and Torak has talked about, he says, this is not really a dialogue movie. There's a lot of silence, a lot of atmospheric voices, music, horses, that is really important. This is a non-dialogue movie, so the atmosphere is much more important. But to go back to the station master, gets on his bicycle to warn the village clerk, and we're going to pick up that scene. Okay, here you go. I'm gonna be sharing my screen everyone. No, no. Hmm. Mi Zsidók jöttek. Ládákat hoztak illatszerekkel. Illatszerrel. Helyben ilyen? Olyan egyformák ezek, kalapszakán. Hányan vannak? Ketten. Nevük? Csak az egyikük neve szerepelt a szállító levélen. Valamilyen Sámuel, Sámuel Herman. Ó, 
Igen, egy biztos nem volt. Írja a többihez. Mennyi tíz is? Honnan szerez maga a tíz kerékpár? Ali! Ali! Jön! Egy pillanat! Tiszteltem! Kacsöcs! Visszajöttek. Jó van, Kacsi Bácsi? Jó. Nincs benne valami dolg? Van, ugye? Jó. És hányan vannak? Egy előre kettő. Jó, Jó van, én bemegyek a hivatalba. És Krennik, lehet, hogy ők is. Az a te dolgod. Nekem megvan a magam baja. Ezek minden túl jönnek. These brief conversations reveal how the villagers perceive the Jews and fear their return. They look the same, not from here, but it comes out later. They could be representatives of Jews who were there. Bandi, the village drunk, is told to tell his wife because the couple is living in a house taken from Jews. Polly, the policeman, asks Ispan if the Kleins have returned because he's living in their home. So the stage is set. Ispan has a deed to the drugstore taken from the Jewish owners. There's a long Jewish uh, association with Jews, medicine, and pharmacy that the Jews supposedly have bought perfume dovetails with this, since that is where perfume is likely to be sold, as the interior shots of the drugstore indicate. One of the earliest Hungarian Holocaust films, Zoltan Fabri's Late Season, revolves around the theme of guilt for betraying the Jewish owners of a drugstore and ends in a suicide like Bondi's in 1945. As the wagon slowly winds through the town, it reminds us of a funeral procession. And they've been told by the stage master, by the station master, to go slow. Uh, so it has that kind of ponderous sense to it. Finally, the Jews in the wagon get to the cemetery and commence with the burial. At the same time, a crowd of villagers marches to the gates of the cemetery, some carrying pitchforks reminiscent of the mobs in Westerns and horror films like Frankenstein, aiming to enforce vigilante justice. So this is the scene at the cemetery.
So they're wrapping everything in a tallit, which follows a religious tradition that men can be buried in their prayer shawls uh, and then covered in white shrouds. Uh, the shoes are icons from the piles of shoes at Auschwitz, but they're not just shoes, they're children's shoes, uh, which makes it even more poignant. And in Hungary, the shoe has even more resonance because of the 2005 memorial uh, in Budapest, the shoes on the Danube promenade, which commemorates the shooting of 20,000 Jews from Budapest on the banks of the Danube in Budapest by Aerocross members in December 1944 to January 1945. The toy train, again, not just the children died, but deportation trains. And then there are the prayer books, uh, the scrolls, the menorah. Uh, why these items? Uh, it's interesting, the man who wrote the story, Gabor Zanto, in the original story, which is called Homecoming, uh, based his uh, story on the actual practice that occurred in Hungary when uh, Jews went back to communities to bury the remnants of their dead. And they buried boxes of soap, because at that time, the rumor of soap was going around that soap had been made from the fat of Jews who had been killed and then cremated. Uh, and it was like burying a part of the body. Uh, the director, Torok, thought that the Jews, uh, that shoes, toys, and ritual items would be more familiar Holocaust icons to contemporary audiences. Uh, the custom, we didn't see them go afterwards but they go to wash their hands. But before that, they throw grass behind, over their shoulders, uh, which is a, uh, a, an orthodox uh, custom of pulling out grass uh, and symbolizing the resurrection of the dead in the age of the Messiah, when the body will awaken and return from the dust of the earth. And then they virtually wash their hands. After Istvan realizes that the Jews have not come to reclaim property, uh, he goes to shake their hand and assures them the village will never forget the Jews who perished. And it's a very difficult scene. You wonder why this Jewish man shakes hands uh, with a man who's basically taken away the pharmacy from a Jewish family there. The playing of the Kol Nidre is also an interesting choice. It's a 1924 recording by a gypsy musician and has a very mournful quality. Uh, but it is after the, all the Kol Nidre, a call to release us from our vows as a first stage of divine forgiveness in that sense, it struck me as an odd choice since most of the villagers lack any sense of remorse except for Bondi who hangs himself out of guilt and Arvad, the son of the uh, clerk who uh, decides to move away rather than stay in this village. Uh, it would have been better perhaps to have the Almali Rathamim uh, chanted and it may be chanted. There is a little bit of chanting we hear in the scene but I'm not, I can't make out if it's that or the Kaddish, it's just not clear. Uh, meanwhile, another drama is playing out. Arvad, the son, no longer, he's supposed to marry that day uh, and then uh, run the drugstore, uh, but he decides he can't do it because he's found a family photo album of the Jews who once owned the store and gets so angry that he realizes what his father did in betraying Jews to get the store. He throws glass, uh, takes a bottle and throws it down on the ground. That's gonna, be, gonna become important. He decides to leave the village, tells his bride to be it's over, and she's very angry, she runs out, she sees the man she really loves with another woman and then angrily runs to the drugstore and burns it down. So let's show that clip.
Emberek, tűz van! Segíts velük! Ég az üzlet! Van. Ég az üzlet! Mi van? Mit beéznél? Mit bámulnak? Mondd el, hogy kész van! That scene begins with the uh, bride's foot stepping near a gl that glass that I mentioned that was broken in the shop when uh, Arvad, her, her would-be uh, fiancé, decided he wanted nothing to do with the ill-gotten store. She uses the perfume as an accelerant, turning something that smells good into the stench of fire. The two actions together harken back to Kristallnacht with the breaking of the glass preceding the burning of synagogues. The last thing we see is the burning of the pages from the Pollock family al album. This was the family that owned the drugstore before. Earlier, the town clerk had burned the promissory note, deeding the store to him to wipe out the legal record of that transaction. Now the burning of the photo album eradicates the visual evidence they had, uh, all, the only visual evidence they had that, that, uh, that Pollocks had ever resided in the village. Thus, he breaks his promise to remember the victims that he told uh, to the two Jews. When Isfan returns to his office, the ashes from the burnt promissory note are still smoking, linking his attempt to destroy the paper record of his betrayal of the Pollocks to the destruction of the drugstore and to their photo album. The movie, the fire gets put out by a torrential rain. Uh, although some critics surmise that this implied a cleansing rain as the iniquities of the past had uh, been wiped out, Torak says no, it happened because rain poured on the last day of shooting. The concluding <laughs> image of the train departing and its exhaust hanging over the landscape signifies a different ending, a cloud of guilt lingering over the village. This interpret interpretation dovetails with Torak's confiding that he focused, quote, on the guilty parts of society, the collaborators, the clerk, the policemen, the priests. That was our way of discovering the story, the layers, the layers of what I would call the banality of evil, evil that occurred without the participation of the Germans or the invocations of Nazi racism. Uh, and all of this is reinforced by the film's somber visual tone, its ominous soundtrack and the erasure of any traces of a prior Jewish presence in this village. And now I'm pleased to pass the baton over to Stuart Liebman for his remarks. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining this event. I want to thank Phyllis Lassner and Holly Levitsky for inviting me to participate, as well as Deborah Briggs and John Stewart, whose technical team produced the clips Laurie and I are using. And I want to add that it's been a pleasure to work with my colleague, Laurie Baron, too. 1945, by the Hungarian filmmaker Ferenc Turuk, 
was released in 2017 and enjoyed an extremely modest success, only limited American box office earnings and uh, a very few prizes internationally. It followed in the wake of another Hungarian Holocaust film, Laszlo Nemesis' Oscar-winning Son of Saul, whose exceptional brilliance was perhaps too hard an act to follow. Indeed, I think that 1945 has been unfairly neglected. It subtly, subtly treats an important subject, the return of Jewish survivors to the villages and towns from which they were deported. And I welcome the opportunity to talk about it with you this evening. To really do it justice, I would need to discuss it against the broad background of Holocaust film production in both communist and post-communist, now illiberal democratic Hungary, but there is unfortunately insufficient time for me to do so. And I would also want to mount a defense of a filmmaker who carefully analyzed the strategies of his medium to create a work of film art about a subject that for many does not require such considerations. No time for that either, but that is my implicit claim as I speak tonight. As you know, 1945 deals with the aftermath of the war when Jewish survivors returned to the villages and towns from which they were deported. This has been a topic of research and debate among Holocaust scholars for at least 20 years since Tomasz Gross's book, Neighbors, generated a huge controversy in his native Poland about the murder by Polish villages of their Jewish neighbors in Yedwabne. And Gross followed up with his book, Fear, which mapped the post-war pogroms and murders that caused the majority of Poland's surviving Jews to flee the country by 1950. These publications prompted huge debates in Eastern Europe, and this is the general intellectual and political background for Torok's film subject. From the clips Laurie has already shown, you can see that 1945 takes an eerily calm if tension-filled take on the question of the avarice of villagers and more generally of so many across Europe and their anxiety about the possible return of their former neighbors after peace was reestablished. 1945 is a great uh, work of great emotional depth in its address to the theme of how Jews haunted the consciousness of those who had robbed them. Laurie had as already mentioned how Taruk and the scriptwriter took inspiration from the Hollywood Western of all things and adapted a classic Western plot as the basis for their story. There are many allegorical parallels. Unknown threatening strangers ride into town, their motives unclear. Threatened villagers, including the equivalent of the town marshal or mayor in Deadwood or Tombstone, unite as a virtual posse in their own defense to monitor what the strangers are up to. A scout, the station master, takes it upon himself to follow what the strangers are doing and reports back to his boss. At the end, their mission accomplished, the strangers leave with the village's moral balance partially restored. In its narrative structuring, moreover, 1945 is classic and how this storyline unfolds. Like classic Westerns, the story is linear, linear. That is, it recounts story events in chronological order. Second, the story is balanced. It begins with an arrival by train and concludes, concludes with a departure, also by train, after the strangers have completed their mission. Note, by the way, how many Westerns end with a burial as this quite unorthodox one, no pun intended, does. And the entire story takes place in a compressed period of time, about six hours in all, which is a fundamental premise of classical drama going back to the 18th century, although not all Westerns comply with this rule as well as 1945 does. 1945 is also classic in the way it uses shots symmetrically to round out the opening and closing scenes, like the arrival and departure of the train, which has already been mentioned. But there are others too that bookend the beginning and the ending to signal that narrative closure is imminent. Remember the similar low angle shots across the field that view the Jews moving toward and then away from the village at the beginning and end of their quest. And there are also a parallel set of shots of them walking across a dusty road through the fields when a camera movement specifically links them ironically, no doubt, to a wooden cross in the open air, both as they approach their goal and as they leave it. But one can also say that Toruk is not simply content to borrow the stylistic premises of a Western. Rather, he extends or exacerbates other aspects of these classical practices in original ways to develop a, a higher, more complex style. He does not do so to create a style for its own sake, 
but rather to express in formal terms the villagers' conspiracy of silence toward the Jews. This is the case in his use of what film study scholars call the editing of shot reverse shot. I'll explain that in a moment. But first, watch the following clip and notice how the editing of the scene binds together the storyline visually as well as thematically. So we'll so show the clip, uh, first clip now. Dohányt szeretnék. Adjál neki, fiam, még töltsd egy pár pesgőt is. Pesgőt, parasztnak, István bátyja. Kár az olyan drága italért. Új világ van. Nem számít ki úr, ki paraszt. Igaz? Csak magyar legyen. So we see some villagers gaze out their windows, pushing curtains away to get a glimpse of the Jews who have arrived in the village's main plaza. The camera shifts from one point of view to another. First Anna, the wife of Ishvan, the village clerk, then the station master from the inn, and finally the innkeeper himself, and then at the end, uh, Ishvan himself. None of the gawkers really speaks, but their looks could kill. All are clearly thinking the same thing. What do the Jews want in this town? Are they agents come to reclaim property, whether loaned or stolen? You can almost read their minds. And if you can't, Ishvan makes it clear. This is a town for Hungarians only. A shot reverse shot sequence that usually first shows someone looking and then see what they see. Often what they see is another person who looks back at them. This is very common in dialogue situations. But here, as Laurie said, there's very little dialogue. But this scene is a bit different because here this does not happen. The Jews the villagers look at do not return their looks. The Jews in that sense lack agency. They are, as it were, mere objects to the villagers, not really subjects of the collective gaze of those who have ripped off the town's Jewish inhabitants. That this device or trope is important to Taruk's telling of the tale is confirmed by other scenes too, because the device of looking out windows in this scene recurs many times. You recall just one instance, then Anna later bitterly recollects how her husband Ishvan stood looking out the very same window she had stood at while witnessing the deportation of Polak, supposedly his best friend, whom he had denounced in order to get control of the pharmacy. Looking out a window, often while pushing the curtains away to remove the visual obstacle, as we've seen in this uh, clip, uh, as they remove the visual obstacle to seeing clearly, becomes a kind of visual metaphor acknowledging a fundamental historical truth of what has happened. I want to move on to a related but somewhat different way in which Torok uses aspects of film language to evoke this thematic truth. Central to this are two key dimensions of the art of cinema, mise-en-scene, that is the way the place is filmed and the objects in them are set up, and camera movement, usually lateral panning shots following the movement of an actor or a vehicle like a bike or wagon, as we've seen. Now, following the shots are so common following shots are so common that they are usually hardly noticed as our eyes follow the main subject as he, she, or it goes from point A to point B. But Turuk complicates such thoughts by having the camera follow this movement through a kind of visual scrim. The scrim could be a stand of trees or a curtain of some kind or fencing or reflections off a window pane. 
All these objects intermittently occlude the subject by temporarily superimposing a kind of visual overlay that momentarily complicates or even obscures what is happening. This occurs repeatedly over the course of the movie. And we've already seen it at work in the clip that I just showed. At the end of such sequences, the visual overlay is usually removed and the subject is fully revealed. And what is revealed in this clear view is often the crux and the underlying truth of the scene. A simple example is the way we see the station master's arrival at the inn to tell Ishvan the bad news of what the Jews allegedly have brought them. Laurie showed that in his first clip, but there's a, a, a preface to that in which uh, the station master, uh, master uh, arrives at the inn. But let's look at this next clip, a kind of static variant of this device. It occurs when Arpad is packed and ready to leave the village, and he comes to the house of his fiance to ask her to come with him. And we'll see the next and last clip. Csókolom. Hát te. Nem készülött? Kis Rózsihoz jöttem. Beszédem van vele. Mi az a bőrönd? Csak nincs valami baj. Beszédem van a mennyasszonyommal. A Jancsi miatt? Azt kérdeztem, hogy a Jancsi miatt? Én nem megyek innen sehova, érted? Ez az utolsó szava. Igen, takarodjál el innen! The scene is obviously a dramatic turning point. There's no real camera movement here, but some of the other factors are clear. He enters a small room with curtain windows looking out onto the road, and the room is also enclosed by a window door covered by a curtain through which the camera peers. The young couple confront each other through a kind of gray haze that is through the curtains on the door out of focus as we, like Rosie's mother and friend, listen in on the conversation. When Arpad grows angry, uh, Rosie refuses to admit that she still loves Yanshi and orders him to leave. He complies and she moves to the window to look out where in fact she sees Yanshi, the man she truly loves as he walks down the road, while Arpad, the fiance she ordered from her house, continues to the train station and on to a new life. What she sees clearly through the window is the fact of her triple loss, of Yanchi as her lover, of Arpad as her husband-to-be, and of her future life as the wealthy owner of the local drugstore and parfumerie. Realizing the truth of her losses, she moves to take out her anger on the drugstore, and you've seen what happens. One final way Turok usually reveals the ultimate historical truth of the Jews' dispossession is through the use of close-ups. There are, of course, many close-ups in the film, mostly of the faces of guilty, worried villagers. But I have another group of close-ups in mind that stand apart from the immediate drama. The heavy silver cutlery paste on one of the wedding tables, the clock with Hebrew letters, the tattooed numbers on the forearm of the younger Jew while he helps to dig the grave, and most tellingly, the treasured objects the Jews bury, which Laurie has described and explained so well. For me, these close-ups have uh, an unanticipated and therefore a powerful effect. One might say that the truth about the expropriations burst out at such moments by reducing the fact of the villagers' avarice, avarice to the display of these humble objects. In conclusion, these brief analyses of scenes reveal how subtly Turuk has used the expressive techniques of his medium to com compose his homage to the dead. By portraying something of the agony of what happened in this quietly stylized way, 
he makes us feel and understand the agony of the Jews in the story more intensively. And not only the Jew in the film who shakes hands so reluctantly and perhaps naively with the town clerk who promises to hold dear the memory of the loss of their loved ones, but also of we in the audience who know that the promises will not be kept. So thank you for your attention. And now Laurie and I would be happy to take a few audience questions, which John Stewart will facilitate. Thank you very much. Those are amazing, amazing comments. And a, a few questions have come in. Um, one was uh, a question, and you can decide who wants to take this, about the, um, particularly about the vehicles that were in the film and how they were the very various vehicles that were used. They were obviously instrumental in a number of different occasions. And one person was wondering what the significance in that context of the Russian soldiers in the Jeep might have been. Um, Anybody want to comment on that? Well, the, the movie, and it's an interesting movie because a, a lot of movies in Hungary made after 1990 tend to emphasize uh, the Soviet occupation and then being a, a, a satellite of uh, the Soviet Union as almost as bad as the Holocaust. Uh, if you go to Budapest, you'll probably go to the Museum of Terror, uh, which you know, there is a Holocaust museum that uh, is, hasn't still open. There's a, a big one. Uh, but they, they don't seem to be able to uh, finalize it. But there is this big one which focuses much more on uh, the Russian rule, Soviet rule. And you don't see, you know, they're kind of benign almost uh, in this movie. You know, yeah, they, they harass the one Jewish guy, try to take away his hat. And they chase, you know, when they see uh, uh, the bride, they, they sort of, you know, give her cat calls. Uh, but otherwise, um, and we know they're going to expropriate property. They're going to redistribute property. But otherwise, they're, it's not an evil sort of scene. So uh, I don't fully understand what's going on. Maybe maybe Stuart has a better sense. No, I think you I think you nailed it right there. It's it's just a reminder that they are themselves occupied now, and that the, their ill-gotten gains will in fact probably be liquidated as small pharmacies and places like that are uh, nationalized. In fact, the first scene, one of the earliest scenes we see is Yanshi with Istvan. Yanshi's in a field and he's demanding to see the registries. Uh, Yanshi is very, I, I don't know if we could call him pro-Soviet, but he's happy that the community has been liberated uh, and he wants to see justice. He even speaks some Russian. Yeah. Yeah, we hear, we hear him try. I, I, I had another question uh, for you all from the audience. It was the about the significance of Arpad's leaving. And I don't know whether you have thought about this, but they're only, um, he's the only person besides the two Jewish visitors who came in for obvious reasons to leave the town. Is there anything that you make of that um, or any ways to think about that? Well, I think Laurie mentioned when he made his comments that uh, having discovered the Pollock album by chance, it would seem, in the storeroom behind the pharmacy, that he understands that, in fact, the father has acquired this pharmacy uh, inappropriately, illegally even. And uh, I think he has some moral fiber, has uh, been forced into this kind of marriage by his parents, by his father anyway, and um, feels awkward about that as well. And when he realizes that his uh, wife-to-be is still in love with his rival, uh, he can't take it anymore and he decides to leave with his mother's blessings, uh, gives him money and urges him to leave. I was just going to, one other, it's not really a question, but we'll kind of wrap up the questions with this. It's an observation from one of the participants, oh, well, sorry, one of the, uh, one of our community members, uh, since we're all in this group together. Uh, two things I will never forget about this film. One is that I remember, if I remember correctly, the Jews had no dialogue. And the two, the scene when the Jews removed the objects from the trunk, I was so emotional that I sobbed aloud. And I know you chose that, uh, that scene to, dis to show. Is there anything that you'd follow up? Um, with about that scene? They do have a little bit of dialogue. The older man has a little bit of dialogue, but very little. Uh, I mean, Stuart has it. They're, they're objects. They're just sort of creatures that come in that uh, uh, just sort of as reminders, they're ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, I, I think that is a very powerful scene and that they go through the rituals as well. You know, they also wash their hands um, and 
do this throwing of the grass over their shoulders. Uh, it's a very powerful scene. All right, thank you so much. With those, uh, uh, with those uh, questions and comments, I think we're gonna turn now um, to uh, Dr. Lasner. Would you like to make some summary comments? Um, first of all, many thanks to you, John, and also to Stuart and Lori for their illuminating interpretations. I'm just going to offer a few words to segue from 1945 to next week's film, Remembrance. Making a connection between the two films, I think 1945 could be seen as a film about Hungary's suppressed collective memory of the fate of their Jewish neighbors and the trauma of the Jews' return. As Lori and Stewart explained so well, the return of just two Jews and their slow procession through a Hungarian village inspires fear and rage that they may be seeking reparations or even retribution. Memory in this film and in remembrance, obviously from the title, becomes a force so powerful that it literally ignites a fire that burns down the pharmacy, as you saw. And of course, fire, as Lori pointed out, uh, refers to Kristallnacht, and it also refers more generally to the fate of the Jews in the Holocaust. And so it, it really is a way of figuratively in a visual metaphor showing how the destruction of both memory of the Jews and the possibility even of the Hungarians acknowledging the guilt of their complicity and also the lack of memorializing the lost. Next week's film Remembrance is a 2011 German production that also uh, focuses on Holocaust memory, but as it affects two individuals. Unlike the imagined scenario of 1945, but like so many Holocaust films, Remembrance is adapted from based on a true story about um, a, a Jewish woman and a Pole who fall in love and escape a concentration camp. I don't wanna to give too much away, but as preparation for viewing, the war separates the lovers and each one believes the other has died. More than 30 years later, Hannah, the woman is married and living in New York with a successful husband and their grown daughter. The Holocaust past, however, remains a haunting memory she has tried so hard to overcome. As a startling reminder of her Holocaust experience, Hannah learns that Tomasz, her Polish lover, is alive. And so suppressed memory is re revived and challenges Hannah to choose between returning to pick up the pieces of her past or committing to her life in the present. Unlike 1945's linear structure, which Lori and Stewart discussed, remembrance moves slowly like the two men um, but differently. Remembrance crisscrosses in time between 1944 in the concentration camp and 1976 in New York. The effect of this temporal structure is to show the irrevocable presence of the Holocaust past and its staying power. Pamela Katz, who did extensive research on which to base her screenplay, has said that she felt nervous about writing a film about Auschwitz and about the Holocaust and the aftermath, especially because it was an exceptional story of love and escape, unlike the larger reality of the Holocaust where millions were tortured and killed. It's noteworthy that her research discovered evidence of four couples who escaped the camp in 1944, the year in which Remembrance is set, 
and she included some of the history she found in her script. Thank you. And now, uh, Dr. Levitsky, you're going to take us, take it away, I think. Is that correct? <laughs> sure. Yes. Thanks, Phyllis. I just want to conclude my portion by um, inviting you to join us next week. Um, we're going to be hosting uh, journalist and producer Tom Tyholtz. Uh, he'll be talking about remembrance. And please reach out to me if you'd like to know more about the Jewish American and Holocaust Literature Symposium. You can write us in the chat and John will send it my way or you can visit jawlit.com. We will be back at the Betsy next October or November. Um, and I'll turn it over to my friend and partner, Deb. Yes. Wow, what a beautiful evening. Uh, just wanted to thank you personally um, for showing us that film is feeling and history and art and everything. So uh, what a beautiful evening. Thank you. I just wanted to say um, on behalf of FIU MBUS and the Betsy and all of our partners, we want everyone to come back. We have two more weeks of stimulating conversation like this. Um, we're here next week at 7 p.m., October 19th, as has been mentioned. Um, and John would like me to say that you are invited to unmute yourself now <laughs> and give our speakers a rousing round of applause. <laughs> Please wear Bravo. your mask. Yes. Please Great wear your mask you this week. Oh Stay safe, Bravo. everyone. Thank you all for yeah. coming. Bravo. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shane and Dunk. Thanks, Shane everybody. And Shane and Dunk. Thank you. Here's the thing, guys. I recognize the voices of members of our community. I love you all. Take good care this week. <laughs> Take care. Love you, Bye. Deb. Thank you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Stuart. You guys are brilliant. Thank you, Phyllis. You Beautiful made job. Really enjoyed it. I'm going to go watch the film again right now. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. See you next week.